Today's episode of the Gone Fission Nuclear Report is brought to you by Floor. We're building a better world. Welcome to the Gone Fission Nuclear Report, your one-stop source for all the latest news from the Department of Energy's Environmental Management Program. Now, here's your host, Michael Butler. Hello, and welcome to the Gone Fission Nuclear Report. Today is Monday, November 13th, 2023. We're covering all the news from the Department of Energy's Environmental Management Program across the country. We thank our friends at Fluor for being presenting sponsor for today's episode. In our last episode, we discussed the planned closing of the Community Reuse Organization of East Tennessee, or CROET. CROET is one of a handful of groups around the country that were formed in the 1990s to mitigate the effects of downsizing at Department of Energy sites following the end of the Cold War. CROET has enjoyed singular success in taking federal property transferred by DOE and turning it into a thriving private industrial park that is attracting new industries and creating hundreds of new jobs. Many of those jobs are playing key roles in the nuclear renaissance. Here's a look back at what former Oak Ridge mayor and two-time Croat chairman, David Bradshaw, had to say about the decision to close. Let me start by saying that um, it's exactly the right time for our crow. Uh, it might be not the right time for another crow around the country. So this is really something that's very uh, personal to our uh, East Tennessee crow. And um, we have, we, we were, we're in very good shape. Uh, the condition financially and otherwise, we have a strong board. Our financial condition is strong. We have come a long way down the road on our mission that we set out to do almost 30 years ago. It's hard to believe it's been that long. And we really had a decision to make is, can we use the resources we have to push very hard to get our, get what we want to accomplish done and um, uh, go quietly into the night, having accomplished that uh, really as a celebration as opposed to um, a struggle. Seth Kirschenberg, Executive Director of the Energy Communities Alliance in Washington, D.C., also weighed in on this subject, commenting on the important role CROs continue to play in environmental cleanup at DOE sites. The, the other things that the CRO does a lot of times is they help bring the community together to focus on the particular site. So, you know, you may have uh, different cities and counties that are close to the site that are that are focused on the workforce and other things. But many of these CROs have a broader regional uh, aspect and impact, and it brings people together to talk about those particular issues, to focus on them. And by people, I mean community leaders, elected officials, uh, and others who are parts of some of their boards. This week, we'll continue our discussion of the important role of CROs and we'll discuss the broader topic of how community support plays a key role in the success of the DOE cleanup mission. We'll be talking with three Department of Energy officials from DOE headquarters, the Portsmouth site in Ohio, and the Savannah River site in South Carolina. We'll meet these guests right after this from Fleur. Well, we're very pleased to welcome uh, our three guests today to the podcast. Uh, uh, first, we have uh, Kristen Ellis, who is uh, with the DOE Office of Regulatory and Policy Affairs at headquarters, uh, where she serves as Acting Associate Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary. Uh, uh, Yvette Cantrell is joining us uh, from a Public Affairs and Community Outreach Office at the DOE Portsmouth Paducah Project Office. And Parado Maith, the Acquisitions Operations Director at DOE at Savannah River. 
So welcome to the three of you to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. We're very happy to have you here. Kristen, I'd like to start with you, if we can. Uh, uh, the the, the uh, Community Reuse Organization of East Tennessee announced recently that they were uh, that they were closing after 30 years in operation. Uh, they have been a, a very successful CRO in terms of the uh, services and the work that they've uh, provided uh, to the Oak Ridge community. Uh, I, I'm wondering, first of all, uh, were you surprised uh, by this announcement? And secondly, uh, just what was your reaction when you heard about it? So as, as I mentioned earlier, surprise is kind of a negative word, and I don't think that necessarily applies here. Um, you know, what Croat has done over the years uh, is really the gold standard for a lot of our other communities to learn from. I think, um, you know, there's a lot of lessons learned we can take for the remaining sites that have future activities. And I, I do think their announcement about closing really signifies that, you know, they've made some wise financial decisions and they have planned for all of the anticipated uh, land transfers and other kind of property activities that took place between uh, the Office of Environmental Management and Croet, and they're ready to, to move to the next chapter. So um, they've, they've had a number of successful projects through Croat's work with the department, um, you know, kind of revitalizing K-25 and taking, you know, what was a Cold War era, um, you know, or actually probably Manhattan Project era, you know, depending on when all the activities took place and bringing it to a future economic vision for the region. Um, so I think, you know, they've done a fantastic job with that mission and, you know, the, the citizens in, of the region and in the local area are going to be beneficiaries for many years to come of the leadership that Crowhead has shown over the years. So you don't uh, see this uh, as a as a negative. Uh, uh, you you view it as a kind of a, a mission accomplished uh, announcement that Croat has uh, uh, pr uh, pretty much served the purpose for which they were created, and uh, uh, obviously they've made a lot of uh, stellar contributions to the community. So it's a it's a good ending story as far as you're concerned. Well, I don't think we'll have an ending yet. <laughs> There's still lots to do. And I think it's a it's an important point to note that um, they're they're a part of our community engagement, but they're not the only community engagement. And by no means um, does Croat accomplishing their mission of land transfer mean that we won't still have constant ongoing uh, partnership with our community members. Uh, and that's a whole variety of different audiences. So I think those are the, the key takeaways from from this announcement. Uh, let's, let me, let me uh, ask Yvette this. Uh, Yvette, you, uh, your site, uh, the two sites that you represent, uh, Paducah and Portsmouth, uh, have two community reuse organizations. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm seeing in the discussion uh, so far that the CROs obviously have done a lot for the communities over the years, but that there's still a need for them. Uh, do you, is that how you see it uh, with the uh, uh, the Paducah Area Community Reuse Organization and the Southern Ohio Diversification Initiative at your sites, uh, uh, do you see th that they've made substantial contributions and there, there's still a strong need for them going forward? Well, absolutely. Um, as we discussed a little bit earlier, uh, the gas use diffusion plants, which Oak Ridge, Portsmouth, and Paducah were the group of gas use diffusion plants, um, the sequencing of the cleanup allowed Oak Ridge as non-operational to go first. And, and I think what it's done for us, it's allowed um, it's allowed us to use the lessons learned from Oak Ridge to better plan our future use efforts with SODA and PACRO. And I, I would say that, uh, you know, SODA's probably at the Portsmouth site. Um, we started D&D &D in 2010. Uh, they're probably about 15 years um, behind Oak Ridge. And I would say Paducah maybe, or maybe 10, uh, Paducah maybe 15. Or 20. So they're just now getting started based on when operations shut down and cleanup started. Uh, well, let's talk about uh, some of the accomplishments uh, of your CROs. I know that the that SODI, the Southern Ohio Diversification Initiative, has been the recipient of, uh, I think it's about 80 acres of land that's been transferred, and there's another 227 acres uh, uh, that will be involved in uh, transfer. And this is a very similar to the Oak Ridge model where government land is being transferred to the uh, CRO for economic development purposes. Can you talk about that a little bit? 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, the we've actually transferred that additional 227 acres. So we now have 300 acres transferred to SODI for economic development, which has been really helpful to them because as you probably have heard, they had a, a pretty positive announcement in the last year about that economic development plans coming to fruition. And they spent many years putting that plan together. So uh, we're currently looking at another uh, 30 acres at parcel three and another um, couple of hundred acres with parcel four and parcel five. So we have active land transfer going on with SODI right now. Well, that's uh, that's really uh, encouraging to hear. Uh, I think the uh, Croat number uh, at this point in time stands at about 1,300 acres in Oak Ridge uh, from the uh, former K-25 site. And, and they've made very good use of that uh, land with attracting some of the uh, uh, small modular reactor uh, uh, technology and uh, fuel and things that are going on there to create jobs and to uh, uh, help to foster the nuclear renaissance. So uh, you probably can look forward to some of those same kind of uh, uh, same kind of progress there. Uh, Prado, I'd like to go to you now and talk about Savannah River. Uh, uh, you work with the uh, SRS Community Reuse Organization, and part of what you do uh, is involved in uh, taking care of the excess materials uh, that are at the Savannah River site that are no longer needed as a result of the, uh, uh, the, the downsizing and the change in missions. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, what, what the CRO does with DOE there? Oh, absolutely. Uh, in the beginning, um, the Crow, what they would do is they would actually bring out trailers and drop them at the different locations on site uh, for the excess materials and the contractor would actually load up the trailers and they would come out and make sure everything's secure and off they would go. But under the leadership of the Crow, they decided, hey, we can be of more advan advantage to you by doing a lot more for you if you would allow us the opportunity. So we looked at what they were currently doing and we established something that we call Asset for Services. And basically the way that worked is they would do certain uh, deactivation and demolition activities, which we like to call D&D &D activities, uh, for us. And in return, we would give them some assets for the work that they have done for us, which in turn allowed us to uh, actually D&D &D some facilities that we didn't currently have the funding for that was out uh, planned for the out years. And one of those activities was we had a number of trailers on site that you know were kind of cold and dark. And because they were not a major issue, they were not in the current funding plans. So the Crow said, hey, we could assist you there by D and D some of those, and in return, like I say, these some excess assets that we had, we gave them. We sat down and came up with a plan as to what we felt was an equitable amount for certain number of trailers. And initially, you know, we gave them a small portion because this was new activity, so we had to ensure that everything could be done safely. And after that very first project, everything was, got, was done so wonderful with no incidents at all. Then we said, okay, well, let's take a look at this. Maybe we can give them more activities to do. And it has become a wonderful partnership over the years. Not only have they demolished, they have demolished probably over about 50 trailers, which if we had had to pay for those, when I say pay, you know, had the contractor or someone else to do it, it would have been millions of dollars of cost avoided. So, and in return, we've given them some assets and what it has allowed us to do because we had minimal costs and the minimal cost comes with, of course, just our oversight. But it's not like, you know, we had to pay fee or anything for them to do that. So it has been wonderful. And we've had some other buildings that they have come and actually deconstructed and hauled it away and took it. In some instances, they have reestablished those buildings and they have sold some of the assets to actually put monies back in their coffers, which in turn they use to 
uh, create some economic development plans in the local communities. And to the tune, I know, in excess of $5 million. Well, I think that's a, that last point you made is a very important one because you've, uh, uh, working with the uh, CRO, you've been able to take uh, excess equipment and materials from the site that basically would have no further use for you at this present time. And uh, the CRO has been able to sell that equipment uh, and and to, to use the funds for uh, positive purposes that benefit the community, and uh, that's that's been a, a, a really a, a tremendous uh, contribution to the economy of the area. I would assume is that right? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Because otherwise, as you were saying, they would have just sat here into perpetuity until or until we actually had the funds to to uh, D and D them. But in turn, they were able to be repurposed or sold off to help the local economy. So the work of the CRO has helped uh, speed up, clean up in some ways, and uh, uh, while generating funds to do things that uh, create uh, create still more jobs in, in the area. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Well, that's a good that's a good story. That's very positive. Kristen, let me go back to you for a minute. Uh, let's talk in general about the, uh, the the value and the need and the importance of community support uh, in the uh, DOE communities. Uh, the CRO is uh, CROs are obviously part of that. Uh, there's a bigger picture there there that involve other organizations and and uh, local governments, et cetera. But can you talk to us about uh, how important uh, local community support is in accomplishing the EM mission? Absolutely. I'd be happy to talk about that. And, you know, what we really see at each of our sites, it's a, the composition of who the stakeholders are and the composition of the local, the municipal or the county uh, governments are, are very varied across all of our sites. And, um, you know, we, at, at uh, Oak Ridge situation, we're, we're looking, we're working very close with the city of Oak Ridge, but also with the surrounding counties. And at many of our locations, we also have uh, tribal governments uh, actively participating in our decision making. Um, and, you know, a variety of uh, obviously state regulators involved who have a serious interest in what kind of decisions we're making for cleanup and, you know, the environmental protection um, agency, we've got, you know, Nuclear Regulatory Commission equity. So, you know, a lot of uh, parties are involved in our decision making process. And the reason I want to highlight that is, um, you know, really, the importance of community support and our ability to be successful cannot be overemphasized. Um, when you have a community and state and tribal and federal alignment behind a shared vision, and a shared goal for the future, uh, it certainly makes it a lot easier for you know, the bureaucrats here in, in DC to advocate on behalf of uh, a cleanup activity. Of course, you know, at, at any given time, there's going to be challenges with the budget and the funding levels. And, you know, when we can carry the message forward that all of our communities are in alignment on a certain goal, uh, it, it makes it a lot easier to convince uh, the, the folks who write the checks if, and uh, the, the folks who make the budget decisions that we're a worthy investment and that you know we're, we're uh, honoring our obligations to do environmental remediation. And you know when, when we know what the communities want and everyone's in agreement, it's, it's able to it's a lot easier um, to support those, those kind of activities. We work in very close partnership with our communities and, uh, you know, we can't be successful without them. Um, just one more quick point before we uh, leave that question. And that's, you know, for those of who have been around our program, you know, it's, it's many decades in the making. And now uh, the conversation is starting to shift to what is that next step? And, you know, what happened with Proit announcing their, their closure is a perfect example of that, of, you know, we're now moving into the ne next chapter of what is the future for these sites? It may be that there's ongoing continuing mission and Oak Ridge has that as well. The Office of Science and uh, National Nuclear Security Administration will have ongoing mission for decades, but it may be something brand new. And for our sites that don't have other uh, DOE equities, um, you know, they're starting to have conversations of, does it make sense to explore nuclear energy? Does it make sense to um, look at other unique, you know, unique 
assets that we have at our lands and properties and real estate and all of these assets that we have, is there a specific vision that uh, makes sense for the community? Um, you may have heard a little bit about uh, a recent meeting we had with the Secretary of Energy, and we've been talking about this, uh, this phrase of clean up to clean energy. And we're really starting to dig in and looking at what our existing land resources are and if those have potential for future clean energy development. So obviously the, the communities are gonna be a huge part of that conversation. And they are the ones who are in the communities working with the local businesses, understanding their energy needs, their um, you know, future employment needs. Uh, and so those are the types of things that, again, we can't be successful unless we're working closely in partnership with all of our stakeholders. Can we talk about uh, some of the other groups besides the CROs that are important uh, uh, at the site level? Uh, the groups like uh, Citizens Advisory Boards, for example, or uh, in the case of uh, Savannah River, uh, Prado, you've got a group there called Citizens for Nuclear Technology Awareness, which is a grassroots uh, citizens uh, support and education group. Uh, you've got the Energy Communities Alliance. There are other groups out there that uh, uh, represent or help the local communities. Uh, can you talk about some of those, Kristen, and uh, the roles they play? Sure, I think you're referring to, your first question was about the uh, EM Site Specific Advisory Board, which is one of those Federal Advisory Committee Act boards. I was trying to avoid the acronym of uh, FACA, but uh, I did explain it beforehand. Um, and so we actually have two advisory boards in the Environmental Management Office. I'll focus my answer on the Site Specific Advisory Board because that one has eight local uh, boards that are part of this overall charter. And uh, we have four of those eight sites, or I'm sorry, three of those eight sites represented here today uh, with Portsmouth Paducah and Savannah River. I guess I included Oak Ridge in that since we've been talking about Oak Ridge so much already. But that also includes um, Nevada, Northern New Mexico, Hanford, and Idaho. So that rounds out the eight. And these groups have been instrumental over the decades in helping us um, because it gives us um, the community perspective of our potential future decisions and that you know we can make them in a vacuum in a federal government sort of environment or we can hear from the communities that are directly impacted by our work and so we use those advisory boards as a way to kind of frame a number of decisions um, that we need their input on uh, that group also meets twice a year with the chairs of each of the eight boards to come together and talk about the whole enterprise and how um, our various activities are impacting them, not just from a site perspective, but you know the eight sites collectively. So that's been a key component to uh, helping us be successful and helping us make better informed decisions. Uh, additionally, you mentioned uh, the uh, one of the groups down at Savannah River. I would say if you go all the way across the complex, we have a number of uh, citizens groups and they have may have formed over uh, a number of different ways. And, you know, we work with a lot of them. There's also, um, you know, advocacy groups not tied to a specific municipal organization, but more tied to issues um, and, uh, you know, environmental justice organizations. There's a whole variety of folks that we engage with on a routine basis. So um, I hope that that's uh, helpful. Happy to explain about any more of those, but I don't want people to leave with the impression that every site's the same. And, you know, just because a site has an advisory board, then they're just like all of the other sites. Um, mm -hmm. And it's really uh, a fascinating group of folks. And we really do strive in EM to hear a variety of viewpoints um, before we make impactful decisions. And I think that has really enabled a lot of innovations and a lot of, um, you know, better decisions that, again, help us get, uh, make ongoing progress and move us to that next chapter of what the future vision is after we finish cleanup. Yvette, um, Kristen uh, talks from a macro level from her, uh, her view from the headquarters standpoint. Uh, can you bring that down to the local area and talk a little bit about uh, community support uh, at Portsmouth and Paducah and how important it is uh, to your mission there? Uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, it, you know, we, it's interesting. We have the same almost mirror images. Our sites are almost mirror images of it. And we have two very different communities, as Kristen alluded to. Um, and the communities have a different need 
uh, with cleanup. And so um, I think us being able to engage with them, sometimes it's it's um, uh, harder, sometimes it's easier, but I think the ability to, to have those transparent discussions with them and find out what their needs are and how our cleanup can align with those needs um, has been beneficial at both sides. What are some of the what are some of the harder ones, uh, the subject areas? What are some of the things that you have to deal with uh, now that uh, maybe are more challenging? Well, I don't think it's a secret, you know, that um, in uh, uh, Portsmouth, um, we don't have an enduring mission like in an Oak Ridge or Savannah River. So as our cleanup comes to an end there, there's obviously concerns about, you know, what the future looks like for that workforce. And so understanding how we can, um, you know, perform the cleanup activities in a way that allows us to transfer that land, that allows that to be used for economic development, how those groups can work together to decide how infrastructure fits into that economic development story. Um, I think that um, has been a little bit eye-opening to us, maybe, you know, because we tend to focus our mission on cleanup. And I think the cleanup mission should in, absolutely include the community's future use vision. How would you characterize the uh, the level of community support uh, at your sites? Uh, do you think it's good? Yeah, both sites. We have a lot of interaction with our community. Prado, mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about uh, Savannah River. Uh, what, to tell us about the uh, community support uh, that uh, you enjoy uh, in, in that area and at that site, uh, uh, and and how how it helps you with uh, your mission there. Oh, what I would like to do is just tie it back to the the crow as well, because what they do for us is they have a quarterly meeting with representatives from the local economic development activities, uh, the Chamber of Commerce and other selected individuals, also along with uh, members from the congressional delegation. And this is a meeting where they actually end from the uh, senior leadership from the different contractors here on site as well uh, attend those meetings. And it actually talks about what we have going on on the site and within the local community and the needs. So everyone at, at a time can hear what's going on and provide their input as to what are needed and and what the Crow does and it helps us is it reaches out to our delegation in Washington because they annually go up and meet with them to talk about the needs of our local communities, to talk about funding and those type of activities and what some of the shortcomings that we have. And those meetings are very positive. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. Um, can, I, can, I, can I add yeah. something to that? Yeah. Yes. Um, so one of the things that I think we found um, that's been successful with our community groups is um, helping them find their spot in all of this. And so, for instance, our SSAB and CABS, obviously the cleanup mission has an end state um, and the community, the Crows and the community leaders have a future vision. So we, what we've encouraged and what we've seen happen positively at both sides is the um, CABS and SSABs in giving their advice and guidance to DOE has incorporated the future vision of the community leaders and the Crows. So that's allowed them to be an integrated team, you know, watching cleanup as it, as it progresses to, um, to the future use vision. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kristen, let me ask you this. Um, the, we, we talked about funding a little bit earlier. Um, give, us a, give us a little bit more on how community involvement and community support uh, impacts uh, funding decisions in Congress. Uh, uh, the cleanup mission depends on annual appropriations from Congress, and uh, it's a lot of money uh, across the complex. And uh, so what, what role does uh, community involvement uh, play in securing the kind of funding that you need to carry out the mission? Well, I'll caveat my answer with saying, you know, I can't obviously speak on behalf of Congress or uh, the Office of Management Budget, uh, since I am not them. Uh, but, you know, certainly uh, I can give you the perspective as, a, as an EM headquarters uh, uh, senior leader who, you know, has an entire complex uh, to think about. And so, you know, certainly 
when you have uh, a variety of different issues. I think about it if I was, uh, you know, a Hill staffer who also had a variety of different issues and things that their member is focused about. Um, community members are uh, are constant. They're they're very uh, closely impacted by our activities because they live in the immediate proximity. And certainly, you know, they can be fantastic advocates for the mission. And as I mentioned before, when there's alignment on what the vision is and what the goals are, you know, it, it's pretty hard to say no to something that everyone's in agreement about. Certainly, we're all going to be living under whatever budget ceilings we have to work within. Um, but you know, when you hear from a variety of voices and a large quantity of voices on issues that are of, you know, huge importance. I mean, we have a, a very large budget, a very important mission. You know, we're the largest environmental remediation project in the world. Um, it, it's also, I think, easy to get behind supporting for that. This isn't a partisan issue. This is a, everyone uh, wants to see environmental remediation happen. So um, finding ways to um, hear those voices is really supportive, is really supportive for us. Um, one other point I'll just make, you know, certainly I think the local communities have found support in the power of, uh, of numbers when they all come together on behalf of the entire complex. Um, certainly, you know, there's a lot of members of Congress, a lot of senators, but we have locations across, all across the country. And when you start having those loud voices of everyone across the complex and recognizing that a success at Hanford is a success at Savannah River and that we're all invested in, you know, continued progress because maybe Savannah River learns from something unique that Hanford did. You know, we're all invested together in the program being successful. So it's it's easy to not stay in the mindset of, I only have to care about my own city. You want the entire country to be successful as we're continuing to make progress. And I think it's it's been, you know, you mentioned Energy Communities Alliance uh, in a previous question. You know, they're a, a great example of a group that advocates for a variety of different municipalities and cities and counties and community reuse organizations. And they've been around for many decades and their voice is just getting stronger because they recognize, uh, you know, the power of numbers and, um, you know, having things that the entire organization can get behind and advocate for. Uh, that's kind of, you know, I don't want to say lobbying 101 because again, I'm a federal <laughs> official and I can't, you know, I don't want to get into trouble with the lawyers talking about lobbying, but, you know, advocacy, um, there is an art and a science to advocacy and, um, you know, finding ways to communicate um, support is really helpful in part of the conversation in, in the DC circles. Right, absolutely. Uh, finally, uh, today, uh, I'd, I'd like to ask each of you, uh, uh, we have an audience uh, out there who's viewing and listening uh, to this podcast, and uh, they're all very interested in the, the cleanup of uh, DOE sites. And And uh, some are uh, have questioned and uh, raised uh, concerns and uh, levels of interest about the Croat uh, decision to close. And uh, this conversation has been very helpful, I think, in uh, helping to put that in perspective. But uh, if you had a message to community leaders who are listening to this podcast today uh, about the importance of community support, uh, uh, what would that message be? Uh, let's start with you, Kristen, if you don't mind, and then Yvette and Prado. Certainly, I would encourage all of our communities to get educated and uh, get smart about all of the activities that are happening in our EM complex. We have a number of ways of doing that. You know, we're on social media. We have podcasts like this one um, that we like to kind of share the news about. So those are kind of two easy ones. Also, you know, we've got the EM update, which is a weekly publication that kind of gives a good update of everything that's happening in the complex. Um, but again, you know, it's a really exciting time to be involved uh, as a community adjacent to our EM uh, activities, just because we've talked about, you know, potential clean energy opportunities in the future, uh, moving past cleanup and thinking about the future visions of what economic development will look like for our communities five years, 10 years, 15 years down the road. Um, I hadn't had a chance yet to talk about workforce, which is another key area that uh, we are working in very close partnership with our local communities, but also with our uh, FCOG, another acronym, Energy Facilities Contact Contractors Group, uh, who obviously represents the contractors all across our complex. You know, they represent 
uh, a huge portion of our workforce. The federal footprint is much smaller there, but recognizing our needs for decades more of work to happen, uh, a need for a workforce, a need for the next generation to come uh, help us accomplish this mission. Workforce is a huge issue, and we've you know worked very closely with both ECA and FCOG on trying to identify some ways we can make that process work better for us. But they're going to be informed by individual community needs and programs, and it's been uh, we've made a lot of progress in the last year or so. And I'm I'm looking forward to talking about some more progress we continue to make on workforce at the National Cleanup Workshop coming up very, very soon. Um, and then I'll just close with one more program that we are about to roll out that I want the communities to be aware of, and that's called the Community Capacity Building Program, um, which is another acronym in and of itself because all the letters sound the same, but I won't, I won't use it. Um, we're getting very close to rolling that out. We're just waiting for some um, additional, uh, we have a requirement under the congressional language to brief the Hill and uh, on our spend plan there, but we're planning to issue a uh, request for information very soon to hear directly from our communities about how we can deploy this funding to help build their capacity and help build these all of these things we've been talking about, future vision, economic development, uh, next generation workforce, um, you know, how, how would they plan for the future in a way that allows them to participate in our decisions where maybe they have not always historically had an opportunity to participate in those. That program is going to be funded uh, or is funded at the $19 million level for fiscal year 23. And I'd really encourage anyone to reach out to me directly to get some more information about that. We'll be having a lot more news about that in the coming weeks and months. Um, but to me, it's, it's an exciting next chapter of what our engagement with our stakeholders is looking like now. And, you know, having these conversations about clean energy and the clean, uh, you know, the future potential of what is possible for our communities is just a uh, fascinating, exciting, and vibrant conversation that's happening uh, in our halls every day. And I'm, I'm excited to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, Yvette? I, I think that never underestimate the power of one voice. Um, uh, our communities, I think at their core, their values are all the same. Their wants are all the same, but sometimes their um, needs may not be the same at that moment. And so um, I want to give a couple of examples that I think maybe you could use is, um, and people could hear about is, uh, for instance, at Portsmouth, um, our SSAB, uh, back in um, uh, the 2012-13 timeframe when we, when we were making our final D&D decisions, um, the Portsmouth SSAB asked us to consider um, the excavation of previously closed landfills and plumes at the site uh, to use as fill dirt for the for our on-site waste disposal facility. Um, that recommendation was actually met with a you know with some surprise at first, um, but uh, after looking at the um, you know the make by decision, it actually was a very good decision, and and it didn't just provide that for the cell as a technical aspect, it also freed up, we're gonna have up to a thousand acres of contiguous land um, to be able to turn over to the community. And that was a partnership between DOE, the SSAB and the Ohio EPA who was willing to look at, you know, regulatory um, approaches to be able to accomplish that. Um, secondly, I would say Paducah is a great example of one voice. Um, about 10 years ago, they just got all of the key players in a room together and said, you know, we need to start dealing with DOE as one entity. And instead of coming to them for individual um, needs is let's prioritize our needs. And they've taken that um, from the local community all the way up to D.C. Um, I think everybody knows the Paducah Fly-In. Is a pretty successful event for them. They take about 50 um, of the regional leaders in the area, and DOE is one of their priority stops. And they make very clear, working with us at the site, you know what they want to see us do for cleanup to, you know, to help them in the future. Toronto. Yes. One final thing, I would like to uh, follow up with what Kristen was saying about workforce. Uh, the Crow, probably about over 10 years ago, they saw the issues we were having with trying to uh, keep our pipeline strong. So what they did was they came up to us, Department of Energy, with a proposal as to how they could assist. So what has happened over the years, we have given them a grant, and what they have done with the 
community with the colleges in the local communities, they have partnered with the colleges and to develop specific courses that are akin to what uh, specific jobs that we need here out at the site. And it has been tremendous, a tremendous success because the local colleges now um, have certain specific classes and they provide grants and activities for the students. And also they have the opportunity once they complete these courses to potentially be hired out here at the site. So it's been wonderful success with uh, the five counties that we have and also the local colleges. So, but as far as the community goes, we have wonderful working relationships. And like I say, with that quarterly meeting that the Crow does, it helps to strengthen what we are trying to do out here at the site and everyone gets to hear and also participate. Well, Kristen Ellis uh, at uh, DOE headquarters, uh, Yvette Cantrell at the Portsmouth Paducah Project Office and uh, Prado Maith at Savannah River site. I wanna thank you for joining us today on the podcast. Uh, uh, information has been very interesting and your insights are very helpful and we appreciate you being with us today. Today's episode of the Gone Fission Nuclear Report is brought to you by Floor. We're building a better world.